Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Steve Taylor. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Rick. Great to be with you. I'll start by just reading your standard little bio that you sent me, and then we can take it from there. Um, Steve is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Metropolitan University, <coughs> which is in the UK, and the author of several best-selling books on psychology and spirituality. For the last two years, he has been included, this year at number 38, in Mind, Body, and Spirit magazine's list of the 100 most spiritually influential living people. Hey, I was wondering, did the Pope make that list? He was in it, yeah, before he died. Was he above <laughs> you or below you? <laughs> I think he was below me, actually. Ah, <laughs> so he should kiss your ring. Yeah, uh, that was a, was a boost yeah. for my ego. Today. Yeah, more, really. More influential than the Pope. This is, that, that whole list seems like a bit of a joke, but anyway, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who makes it up. His books include Waking from Sleep, The Fall, Out of the Darkness, and his latest book, Back to Sanity. His books have been published in 16 languages, while his articles and essays have been published in over 40 academic journals, magazines, and newspapers. Eckhart Tolle has described his work as an important contribution to the shift in consciousness, which is happening on our planet at present. Andrew Harvey has said of his work, its importance for our menacing times and for the transformation being birthed by them cannot be exaggerated. Steve is also a poet. His first book of poems and spiritual reflections, The Meaning, has just been published. He may read a poem or two during uh, this interview. And Steve lives in Manchester, England with his wife and three young children. So there you go. <clears throat> so you've written about seven books, as I understand it. And mm -hmm. um, I have read portions of two of them. I was reading Out of the Darkness, and I think it's called Back to Sanity. And I was I was intentionally flipping back and forth, like reading a chapter of one and then a chapter of the other, and then back and forth, just to sort of mix it up a bit. Um, and they both present interesting ideas, I think, with plenty of potential for discussion and, and thought. Um, so what's uppermost on your mind, you know, having written these books and obviously pondered the topics in them much more deeply than I have, what would you like to start with? Well, I think maybe the, the starting point of my writings and my research is a sense that there's something slightly wrong with human beings, as most human beings are, and as most of human beings experience reality and how we interact with reality. So I think that's, that's been my, probably since I was 15 or 16 years old, and maybe even younger, that's probably been my, the mainspring of my inspiration, if you like. Yeah. I've had this sense that there's something wrong with human society, with human beings, and I've, I've studied the human psyche to try to, uh, to try to explain exactly what is wrong, and also to try to heal the pathology of the human psyche. In recent years, I've been moving more and more into trying to, trying to find ways of healing the pathology of the human psyche and investigating ways of moving towards a state of harmony and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, most of us want to get to be about that age, begin to feel that there's something very wrong with the world. Um, but most of us end up just sort of joining the, the, the club anyway, eventually. Mm. And, you know, and then 20, 30 years later, you think, well... What happened? I just got all sucked up in it and never really, never really kind of uh, sorted it out. You know, I've just become part of the thing that I was criticizing when I was a teenager. Mm. Yeah, well, for me, it was important. When I was about maybe 19, 20 years old, I started to be interested in anthropology, and I read books about indigenous peoples, and later on that led to my book, The Fall, which was published maybe six or seven years ago which is really a study of the way that uh, indigenous peoples perceive the world and also how that, dif how that differs from the way that Western so-called civilized peoples perceive the world. And even um, if you go back into prehistory, I was always interested in archaeology too. And if you go back quite a long way, well, into prehistory really, beyond history, you find that evidence that the people perceive the world in a different way, that they didn't perceive the world in a kind of exploitative Object, object-related way. People in prehistory seem to have had a strong sense of connection to nature, mm -hmm. and they sense, seem to have had a natural sense of the sacredness of nature, which we've lost. And that's certainly true if you investigate many of the world's indigenous peoples. Most indigenous peoples don't perceive the world in the kind of separate way which we do. They have a sense of communion 
with nature. Nature seems to be more alive to them and therefore becomes more sacred and they develop a more respectful attitude towards it. Do you well, think for many, well, for many of us, for most so-called civilized Western peoples, nature is a kind of like a, a, a dreary grey backdrop to their existence, which, we're, which isn't really alive and therefore we're entitled to exploit and abuse it. Do you think that that perspective somehow arose from our Western spiritual traditions, or do you think that it's the other way around, that our Western spiritual traditions kind of conform to that viewpoint? I think it's the other way around. I think the, the Western spiritual traditions, with their monotheistic uh, deities, monotheistic traditions, and their sense that God is somehow outside nature, and God is somehow apart from the natural world, that stems from the sense of separateness which pre-existed that. So in, in my book, The Fall, I suggest that about, about 6,000 years ago, beginning about 6,000 years ago and over the following centuries, there was an event which I call the ego explosion. And if you look into the archaeological record of that time, there's a strong, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that that was the point when human beings developed a strong sense of individuality and separateness. It was only certain groups in certain parts of the world, ma mainly the Middle East and Central Asia, the groups who lived in those areas, seemed to be the first peoples who really sensed themselves as separate to the world and also separate to each other. There was a sense that the individuals became more significant than the communities. And so that, that was really the, the beginning of it all. That was the beginning of the fall. You know, that's the, the, what I call the ego explosion. Hmm. And human beings developed a sense of separateness and duality to the rest of the world. Now, it might be easy to sort of uh, regard that as a, um, as a de devolution uh, you know, from a more pristine, innocent, uh, enlightened state. But, mm -hmm. but perhaps it could also be seen as an evolutionary phase that one has to go through, much as you, know, you go from childhood to adolescence to adulthood and you have to go through a phase where you lose your innocence and then eventually can perhaps reemerge re in a more integrated state. You think? Well, that's one way of looking at it. And you know, there is some... You can see the, the logic of that view, because in some ways, the ego explosion was an advance. It was in the, in the centuries and the millennia following the ego explosion that human beings developed the first really advanced technologies. There was evidence of a new kind of logical, syntactical, you know, kind of uh, expertise and, and brilliance. And yeah, there were, there, were, there were lots of technological and sort of intellectual advances which came about. But one of which is enabling us to have this conversation. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. you know, the, the possibility of global proliferation of spiritual teachings mm -hmm. w has only been there for a short while, you know, given, given, I mean, people like Jesus and Buddha, they, they could reach as many people as they could walk, uh, you know, a short mm -hmm. ra radius mm -hmm. around their birthplace. But um, in our day and age, this knowledge of this sort is kind of just spreading everywhere and people in Mongolia and <laughs> you know all kinds of remote areas are tuning into teachings on the internet which were once very rare and exclusive yeah well that's true that's true but I mean on the one hand there are two factors there on the one hand people tend to underestimate the level of technology of prehistoric peoples that's they true. were by no means complete savages they did have a, a fairly advanced uh, level of technology it was just that after the ego explosion it suddenly intensified. In a book. If you go back you know, 10,000 years, there's evidence of, there was a culture called Old Europe spread over Middle Europe, Southern Central Europe. And um, they had a fairly advanced level of technology. You know, they used the wheel, they had houses of several stories, they had villages with maybe 15,000 inhabitants. But it was just that after the ego explosion, there was an intensification of technological expertise, so it definitely did have an effect. But on the one hand, the negative consequences of that were so massive. You know, it's. I mean, it's about six thousand years ago that warfare becomes incredibly intense. There's there was there's some evidence of warfare before then, but it's very, you know, it, it's it's very few and far between. It was only about six thousand years ago, six thousand years ago that warfare became incredibly intense and became really pathological. Mm. And that's also when the first hierarchical societies developed. 
the first societies with classes and castes. The first societies where power and wealth was concentrated into a small group of elite people. And male domination began at that time as well. And also, it was the first signs of human beings becoming divorced from the natural world, the first signs of exploitation and abuse of the natural world. So in that sense, you know, it can't really be considered uh, a kind of advance or evolution. In fact, what really happened, you know, to go into detail, was a psychological shift. But because the ego became so powerful at that time, people's, the individual's psychic energy became completely concentrated on the ego and all the functions of the ego. And therefore, all of the psychic energy, which used to be concentrated on perception, on relating to the present moment or to the world, was reduced and diverted to the ego. Hmm. So the ego became a powerful center of consciousness, and all the sort of perceptual functions which enable us to perceive the, the beauty and wonder of the natural world and to feel one with it, all of those functions faded away. Yeah, the reason I kind of suspect that there may have it may actually be a necessary evolutionary phase is that I mean I think as a, as you mentioned in one of your books that there was a time not too long ago where uh, you know a large percentage of the population was in constant misery due to toothache, you know, mm. and yeah. uh, and so many things. I mean there was no anesthesia. There were there were so many er areas in society which, in which, which could totally ruin your life. So many things that could happen, and mm. and which these days you know with our modern technology we we you know have more or less solved but of course we've created new problems but what i'm suggesting is that um you know these days there are people who are you know fully on top of the technological curve who have come full circle to an enlightened mm. state of consciousness where they perceive the world with that with that richness and depth and profundity that mm -hmm. you're suggesting you know ancient cultures did and that's yeah. that's their day-to-day -day living although they might be driving a fancy car and flying around the world in airplanes and and so on and so forth so it's kind of like uh in, in a sense there are indications at least that we can have the best of both worlds yeah well yeah i agree i completely agree i mean in the fall i suggest that over the last few centuries there has been a a, a turning towards a full circle mm -hmm. there has been a sort of a movement towards reconnection and reintegration with the natural world. And I, I do suggest that that is an evolutionary advance. And evolution from the beginnings of life has been all about the intensification of consciousness. And even the most simple life forms have a degree of awareness of reality. They are conscious to a degree. They react to their environment and so they react to heat or light or yeah. food sources. But as you move through evolution to slowly more complicated life forms there's an intensification of consciousness and exp an expansion of consciousness so so living beings become slightly more aware of their surroundings they become slightly more self-conscious they have slightly more ability to adapt to their environment and to change their environment to control their environment and that continues right through you know from plants to insects to mammals right through to primates and human beings and in that sense human beings are probably the most conscious life forms uh, which exist or have existed we probably have the most intense awareness of reality the most intense conceptual awareness we're the beings who are most aware of things like death and the complexity and intricacy of our surroundings but what, what I think has happened over the last three or four hundred years, probably beginning, really beginning in the 18th century, is a further intensification and expansion of consciousness. I think what happened, what became really significant in the 19th, in the, sorry, in the 18th century, in the latter half of the 18th century, was that there was a sudden, a sudden eruption of compassion and empathy which had never really existed for thousands of years. Suddenly, people became concerned for the rights of other human beings. They became concerned for the rights of animals. It was the beginning of the women's rights movement, the anti-slavery movement, the animal rights movement. It was the beginning of, uh, of socialism and democracy, ideas of you know egalitarianism. All of that began at that time. And that was really a manifestation of a sense of empathy and compassion. So to me, 
Is that your dog? Coming yeah, in? I'm just. You continue. Oh well, yeah, but we were talking. We were talking about animal rights. Right there we go. There, this dog has the right to go out. <laughs> yeah. We can empathise with the dog. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was what happened, and I think to me that suggests that there was a movement beyond separation, the kind of separate ego, which had developed six thousand years ago. People began to transcend the separateness of that ego, and that's intensified over the last few hundred years, the last 200, 300 years, people have become more and more connected, more and more interconnected. There is more and more empathy. And particularly over the last 100 years, there's this sudden upsurge in interest in spirituality and self-development. So to me, all of that is an evolutionary movement. It's a product of a collective intensification and expansion of consciousness. Yeah. Well, I mean, you say 200 years, but you know, I, I kind of think of the the uh, hockey stick curve that they use for talking about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which it, it, you know, it kind of goes along like this, and then all of a sudden it starts going like that, uh, mm. straight up. There, I would say that we're on that phase of the curve in terms of development of consciousness. Um, there's just a, kind of an epidemic going on, an explosive uh, spread of interest in enlightenment and awareness and non-duality and the whole deal. Mm. Um, and I think that has exciting implications. Yeah, and uh, and the kind of the paradox is that well, no, it's not really a paradox, but an irony, if you like, is that it's technology which has enabled that. You know, technology was a product of the ego explosion, which initially created all of those negative effects. But now it is enabling, or it's encouraging this amazing upsurge of spiritual development. Yeah, I think I heard. I think it was in your interview with Ian McNay that I heard you say something about. You quoted some guy as having said that when um, entrenched institutions or, or ways of thinking are kind of met with the, when they're sort of uh, on the verge of extinction, they they somehow become aware of it and become more uh, ag more accelerated or more evident, uh, but and it might seem that to the casual observer that they're getting stronger, but they're actually in their death throes. Can, is that what you were, you're saying something along those lines? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was a guy called um, a Swiss philosopher called Jean Gebser, mm -hmm. and he had an idea that you can you can pinpoint certain phases of evolution throughout human history, and he believed that we're moving into an integral phase of human history at the moment where there is more and more interconnection, more and more awareness of spiritual realities and greater sense of compassion and empathy. And, and that's why I believe, and people do sometimes say to me, you know, how can you say that? Because the world is, you know, there's global warming, there's all kinds of political and economic problems we're facing and people are becoming more and more materialistic, more and more obsessed with status and, and fame and power. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I'm not sure if that is true. I, I, I suppose in some ways, you know, people are becoming, uh, in some ways, our societies are becoming more materialistic and the media is encouraging people to think of happiness in terms of success and wealth. And it's definitely true that we're facing serious problems through global warming and economic and political problems. So yeah, so Jean Kepser did say that these are the things which will happen at the transition point, you know, the old characteristics try to maintain themselves mm -hmm. just because they're on the threshold of dying. It's like a dying person struggles to keep themselves alive. They really fight, they cling to life, or they may cling to life. So it's a similar thing happening now that those old characteristics are clinging to assert themselves, they're trying to stay alive. Yeah, I think the point is worth making simply because people can listen to the kind of things we've been saying and get think you know become cynical and you'd be discouraged because yeah, as you say there are so many problems in the world the news tells us about them every night and it might seem hopeless you know huge banks and corporations seem to be running the governments and the environment is going to hell and uh, you know there are so many different political problems and you know loose nuclear weapons are proliferating around the world any number of things could do us in and mm. so people think well we're, we're screwed you know <laughs> there's no hope but um you know, if you and and it's easy to fail to see the undercurrent of spiritual development, that's t spiritual mm. awakening that's taking place because it's subtle, and uh, yet if you're in the midst of it, it doesn't seem so subtle. It seems very real and tangible, and this other stuff almost seems peripheral, mm. and, and you can kind of 
at least maybe it's just a optimistic belief, but you get the conviction that eventually the the spiritual upwelling is going to win, <laughs> and that the other stuff, because it being more subtle, it's more powerful. It's more kind of mm. um, it's deeper. Yeah, it's deeper. There's there's a sort of a deeper leverage or or mm. you know, well, like you know, take examples from physics. The deeper you go, the more powerful it gets, and the more the more you can affect a large change with just a subtle shift uh, this yeah. way or that this way or that. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of parallels because. In a way, um, the individual, well, I think most human beings experience a kind of discord. We often experience a kind of discord on the surface of our minds, a kind of restless thought chatter of anxieties and worries and responsibilities, the kind of this, the disturbance of our associational chatter, which may trigger negative states of mind or negative feelings. But always beneath that, there's, a, there's always a, a deeper level of harmony, and stillness, which we don't always have access to, but it's always there, and that's the true nature of our being. So I think in a similar way, all of these difficulties we've, we're facing as a species, they're kind of superficial, it's like the discord on the surface, but beneath that, there's this deeper level of increasing interconnection and increasive, increasing collective harmony. Yeah, and... Uh I can't think of all the examples, but there are there are a number of examples from physics where, when the when a phase transition occurs, like let's say from water to steam or something, there's a a kind of a a turbulence that takes place mm, uh, mm. at the at the point of the transition, and and then things become totally different. And so I you know, and, and I, we're not the first to ponder this, but many people have suggested that the the turbulence we're seeing in the world is is just the sort of the purging or the you know, mm. the, the working out of stuff that really ultimately has no place in an enlightened world and it's just going to have to and it, but it's going to kick and scream a bit as it gets as it yeah. gets dismantled <laughs> yeah it's it's very similar to the the transformation which a person undergoes when they touch into enlightenment i mean mm -hmm. i think that there's a bit of a myth that spiritual awakening is always a blissful, problem-free process. In fact, in my research as a, as a psychologist and also my personal experience, most people who experience awakening go through a difficult period, a, a period of adjustment and integration. Mm -hmm. And often enlightenment, I mean, this goes into my book. Out of the Darkness. The darkness. Yeah, 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 where I, I, sp I spoke to about... 30 or so people who'd undergone spiritual awakening as a result of intense turmoil and suffering in their lives. So they were people who'd experienced bereavement, uh, severe depression, alcoholism, cancer, cancer, yeah, becoming severely disabled, many other, you know, extremely difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. But for them, these, their predicament had been a trigger. It'd been a, it, well, it had generated a higher state of consciousness. Usually it was at the point where they accepted their predicament. So often, as most people will react, most people, it's kind of natural for us to resist suffering and difficulty in our lives. You know, we try to fight, we try to resist, we try to get better. But I found that it was when the people, they kind of surrendered to their predicament. They stopped resisting it. They accepted it. And that was the you know, that was often the very specific point when they experienced a transformation of consciousness. It was the point where the shift occurred. And many, most of them could pinpoint the exact moment when that happened, where this shift suddenly occurred. And it was just like, uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the people described it in terms of a, um, a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. That's why there's a, there's a butterfly on the cover of the book. Because that was, that's really what it's like. It's almost as if there's a, a latent higher self inside many people. I would, often, say, I, I would say there's a latent higher self inside everyone. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> not, yeah. But maybe in some cases it's ready to hatch, and other, yeah, ca other cases right. not so much. Yeah, I mean, that was the, the, the problem I was sort of uh, deliberating over in the book was when we all go through intense suffering at some point in our lives, all human beings experience intense suffering at some point. So why do some people react by shifting into a higher state of consciousness permanently, whereas most people 
just react, um, just suffer negative consequences. Most people suffer even more. They just, um, you know, they don't experience any relief or any transformation. Yeah, I mean, hearing you talk about suffering being an impetus to an awakening, one can one immediately thinks of, you know, the Nazi concentration camps or the fact that there are you know a couple billion people in the world who are you know, mm. malnourished and, uh, you know, living very, very difficult lives. And you think, well, how many of those people got, get enlightened or got enlightened? Mm. And, you know, so uh, have, you, have you thought about that? What's your answer to those yeah, questions? Yeah, well, um, on the one hand, there's evidence that some people in concentration camps did experience spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. There was a lady uh, who wrote a book about it. She was having all this div divine perception and all kinds of beautiful stuff in the midst of that situation. Yeah, there was, um, there was a German psychologist who, who did research after the Second World War and he found that some people experienced liberation in concentration camps, others when they were refugees, when they had lost everything as a result of the war, and also soldiers who heard a bomb explode close to them who were convinced that they would die. And he found that you know, there were many cases of spiritual awakening and he, he explained it as an encounter with death, that when you encounter death, when everything is taken away and everything is reduced to that particular moment in your encounter with death, then you're so naked, everything is so stripped away that that's the moment when a latent higher self can emerge, it's when the ego completely breaks down and a latent higher self emerges. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's one way of looking at it. I mean, I think it's probably more common than we they, than we realize. Yeah, yeah. That you mentioned that in your book that you had you felt that in quote unquote enlightened people were much more common among us than than we realize. There's all and and perhaps many of them don't even realize what it is they're experiencing, but it is some higher state. Or uh, yeah, I am hesitant to use the word enlightenment because it has mm. to be a, a kind of a superlative connotation and rather yeah. static connotation I see it more in terms of many many stages of awakening and mm. and you know but even a, a relatively preliminary stage can be dramatic and profound and life tra and transformational for a person if if they've been mired in suffering for yeah yeah, yeah I, I completely agree with you I'm a little reluctant to use the word enlightenment too partly because it was it originated in a Buddhist tradition so it has a specific meaning in right. the Buddhist tradition, where well, people have taken that term and used it, you know, in a sort of very general way. And also, yeah, it, it's definitely not the case that there is a, you know, there is a sort of cut-off point between ordinary consciousness and enlightenment. There are lots of gradations. Mm -hmm. There's a, a large grey area in between. And even once people become awakened, then they don't stop developing. They continue to develop, but in a different way. Right, so uh, to take an example from your book, it's not that some cancer patient, you know, suddenly becomes the Buddha, but perhaps the, the crisis they're, they face just shifts them into a completely different appreciation of life and orientation to life and, and sense of values and priorities mm. and so on. And to them, that's a night and day difference from the way that they had been living up until that time. Yeah, they do literally become different people with a different state of consciousness, a different experience of reality. And all of those value, all of their values change. I mean, even to the extent that they often become divorced or separated from their partners because their partners don't know who they are anymore. They feel that they're together with a different person, mm -hmm. and you know they have lots of lots of friendships come to an end. Although they, you know, they quickly develop new friendships to replace them. Yeah, but it's almost as if they they shift to a different road, but they still they're still moving along the road, but it's a different road, and it's well, it's a state where they completely different relationship to reality and it is certainly an awakened state in many ways it's so it's so different to ordinary consciousness and it's such a higher functioning state even though it does come with certain problems but it's on every level it's a higher functioning state it's a state of appreciation it's a state of increased connection to other people and to nature it's a state of increased well-being and even, you know, it's a state where people become, in some ways, better able to function in everyday life. You know, they, they feel a sense of mission, a sense of purpose, together with that strong sense of altruism. Mm -hmm. So it is it's, it's, it's a certainly a, a very distinct and different state of consciousness.
You, the way you're describing it now makes it sound like it is it's a very specific, definable state that pretty much everyone gets to. But uh, uh, is that so, or are, are there as many varieties as there are people, and, and there are just cer certain characteristics that tend to be common, but what you're really saying is that suffering in crisis can be a, a trigger to undergo a shift, but not always a shift to the exact same thing. Well, I think I think it has very it has very strong um, similarities. I think I think there's a basic core which is the same. Mm -hmm. In the same way that I mean, I I, I speak about a, a self structure or a psychological structure. I think ordinary consciousness or the, the state of consciousness which most people experience, it has a certain psychological structure. It has certain psychological characteristics. One of them is a sense of separation. Another is a sense of disturbance and discord because of restless thought chatter. And also sort of deep-rooted uh, thought patterns which may be negative, negative critical, self-critical thought habits. And you know, those are some of the characteristics of ordinary consciousness. But this state of consciousness, it has certain common characteristics even though it has some, some, you know, some sort of variation as well. Could you give us one or two examples of people that you wrote about in your book who you know, were really going through a tough time and then underwent the sort of shift you're talking about? One example was, um, it was a guy uh, called Kevin who I used to uh, teach with at a college a few, several years ago. He was the counselor, a counseling tutor at a college where I did some teaching. And I noticed, even before I knew his story, I noticed there was something different about him. He had this air of serenity and friendliness about him. He had a very sort of positive atmosphere around him. And later on I found, he told me a story, he, he was an alcoholic and quite a severe alcoholic. And about 15 years previously he'd lost everything because of his alcoholism. He'd lost his family, his wife left him with the children, and he lost his job because the clients didn't trust him anymore. He was, uh, he'd run an architecture company, his own architectural business, but the clients no longer trusted him because he'd become unreliable. And also there were, there were economic problems in the UK at that time, and he lost all his savings, all his business. So basically he was reduced to nothing. He had a, maybe £200 left in his bank account, no family, no wife, no job. Uh, he, was, he was actually in debt, £50,000 in debt as well. And he decided to spend his last £200 on alcohol and basically drink himself to death. That was his plan. <laughs> he, he wanted to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. But um, he was in a telephone box uh, one evening and he saw an advert for Alcoholics Anonymous for a meeting. So he decided he had nothing to lose. He decided to go to this meeting. And he immediately sensed something positive about it straight away. And he managed to stopped drinking for a few days and he went to a meeting twice a day, alcoholics in the meetings twice a day and after a couple of weeks or so there's a point in the AA process where you hand over your problem you say this is too big for me to deal with, I'm going to hand it over to a higher power and he wasn't religious, Kevin didn't believe in God but he just decided to go along with this process so he said mentally to himself this problem is just too big for me to deal with, so I'm going to hand it over to whatever's there, whatever a higher power means, I'm going to hand it over to this higher power. And as soon as he did that, he felt as though something broke through inside him, something gave way inside him. And there was suddenly a flood of well-being, kind of energy was released inside him. And he immediately felt like, you know, he was a different person somewhere. He felt a sense of peacefulness he'd never known before a sense of inner peace and harmony you've never known before. And he expected it to be temporary, but it, re it remained with him for days, for weeks, even for months. And it remained with him permanently, this sense of harmony and well-being. And, you know, he, he still has that now, 15 years later, or more than 15 years now, he still has that sense of inner well-being and harmony. And it led him to, you know, to pursue an interest in spirituality, which he'd never known about before. He trained to be a hypnotherapist and a counsellor, which is why he became... He, at that time, he was working as a counsellor with, counselor with cancer patients. So he totally changed his life. He changed all his values. 
but most of all it, it connected him to this source of well-being and inner fullness which he'd never known before so that, that's one example mm. you mentioned earlier uh, the similar theme that it seems that the suffering pushes people to the point where they realize they can't do it on their own or, or they're, they're, it's beyond their control or something and then there's a surrender or a mm. letting, letting go and then they fall into a higher state uh, I, does that seem to be a common theme with all these different stories? Definitely, yeah. I mean, the main factor was acceptance. That all of the people who underwent this spiritual transformation, mm -hmm. they all reached a point where they accepted their predicament. It was, a, well, you, yeah, sometimes they spoke about a surrender, but it was all a letting go. It was a release. Yeah. And it, it was at that moment of acceptance when the, the transformation occurred. And well, I'll, I'll give you an, another example, even more uh, kind of um, dramatic example. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, an author, an American author, called Michael Hutchison. He was, I think he was quite well known in the early 1990s. He published a book called Mega Brain, which was quite successful. Oh, yeah, I heard of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not long after that, in the mid-1990s, he had a, a very severe accident and became severely disabled. Mm. Uh, he, was, uh, he was running and he slipped on a, a rocky path and fell, onto, fell over a bridge onto a riverbank, sorry, Oof. onto a riverbed. Ah. So he broke his spine, he, he damaged several vertebrae in his spine and became paralyzed, basically he was paralyzed from the neck down. Hmm. And you can imagine what an incredibly devastating, depressing experience it was. So for months afterwards he wasn't able to move, he was in a neck brace and wasn't able to move. He, all he could do was just literally lie down and stare at the ceiling for months. And he had problems with medical insurance as well. His insurance ran out. So he was taken to some kind of psychiatric institute which was completely unsuitable where people with psychiatric disorders were, would scream and you know, he was in, be in a very distressed state. So he's, li he's, he's lying there paralyzed listening to them scream. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So he, he basically lost everything. You know, he could no longer write. He could no longer go running. He could no longer make love. He could no longer do anything which he'd enjoyed before. So as you can imagine, he was, he was incredibly depressed. He wanted to die, basically. Uh, but the, there was one morning about two years, I think it was around two years after his accident, he was being taken for a shower in his wheelchair uh, by a nurse. And he heard a voice inside his head say, what are you doing, man? Why are you, why are you resisting? Just let go, just let go. And he didn't really know what it meant, but he, he decided to let go, to just release his resistance to his predicament. And suddenly, just like Kevin, he felt this sudden upsurge of energy and well-being inside him, as if something had broken, broken down and... A bit like um, you know, a river that had been dammed, but the dam had suddenly given way and this flood of peace and serenity suddenly welled through him. And that was, that was a big turning point for him. After that, he felt this incredible sense of bliss. You know, he felt, even though his, his predicament was so difficult, he felt incredibly appreciative of, of being alive. He felt incredibly appreciative of being able to see, you know, just be able to see the world around him. And, and that remained, you know, years later, you know, he was still in the, it's, it's a couple of years since I've had contact with him, but he was still in that same state of bliss and appreciation. And also, you know, fortunately he, he did experience some return of movement as well. He became able to use his fingers again, he became, became able to type. Hmm. So um, he was preparing to write another book you know, the last time I spoke to him. Nice. As I was reading your book, um I was thinking that, that from some verse from the Upanishads about bliss, and I couldn't remember exactly what it was or where it, what Upanishad it was in or anything. And then as I was wondering, thinking of looking it up, the uh, very next day a friend sent me an email with that verse in it. So <laughs> things, th things happen like that, you know. But, yeah. um, but uh, here it is. It's um, from bliss, Ananda, verily, all these beings are born by bliss, when when born, do they live into bliss? At the time of dissolution, do they enter? Do they merge from the Taittiriya Upanishad? And the reason I thought of it is that, you know, 
from that perspective of in that philosophy or way of looking at the world this is, we're we're like little fishies in an ocean of bliss it's all bliss it's all ananda mm. and and why i i was kind of, i was asked my my friend and i were discussing this why should it be bliss and my thought was that <clears throat> you know there has to be a very powerful force for individuation and specification in order for creation to manifest um, and the, fo- the forces even in, un- as understood by physics physicists are very powerful so there has to be an equally powerful counterforce for the the awareness to turn within and go back to the unmanifest and that counterforce is bliss or ananda mm-hmm. so so like you say we everyone in uh, as an embodied being gets in individuated gets trapped gets bound you know the spiritual traditions speak in terms of bondage and and liberation mm. and then there's a return journey in which we rediscover our essential nature and that mm. journey is in the direction of more and more bliss um and the return journey obviously is as various as people are various and i think some people really need some hard knocks in order to <laughs> kick them in that direction mm. other people perhaps they they embark on it willingly and volitionally you know they may engage in spiritual practices which mm-hmm. can enable them to undergo the same sort of transition uh, quite smoothly although again there there's going to be turbulence as things are worked out mm-hmm. but without having ha- to go through such um trials and tribulations mm. but you know that's a little bit um glib to talk that way because who knows you know life is mysterious and you know you think Mm -hmm. of the story of Job in the Bible where he was put to these severe severe tests uh, in order to for God to prove a point or something Uh, so but it but if we kind of step back to as far as we can and 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 if we kind of have the understanding that the universe is fundamentally motivated by an evolutionary force which mm. has as its ultimate purpose the living realization of reality in, a, in an embodied form, mm. th- then everything that happens to us is, can be seen as ultimately benign and in, in our best interests, as horrific as it might seem uh, in the moment, it, mm. it, it ultimately serves an evolutionary purpose. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I certainly agree that bliss is a, a fundamental condition of life, um, yeah. It's, um, I think is it also in the Upanishads? It, Upanishads. It talks about sat chit ananda, exactly be, being consciousness bliss. Mm-hmm. So being bliss is a condition of being in the same way that wetness is a quality of water. Right. Bliss is a condition of life. Mm-hmm. And I think in in awakening experiences, you can sense that. You know, in in powerful awakening experiences, which I've had. There's always a sense that the whole universe is pervaded with a radiance, a harmony. Mm-hmm. And that harmony is so powerful, it's like a, a very tangible electric force, which you almost feel, it always, it's so tangible, it almost feels solid. But obviously it's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's an energy which fills the whole universe. But it's certainly there, and it has, you know, it has a quality of love, it has a quality of harmony, and it's so powerful that it infuses the whole of the universe every object in the universe every being all objects all non-material seemingly non-material objects and all living beings are filled with this energy this brahman you know this incredibly powerful spiritual force whose nature is love or bliss mm-hmm. yeah um it's said in some circles that the, the very purpose of creation is the expansion of happiness. Um, you know, you can sort of think of unmanifest creation as being qualityless and and flat and uh, you know without attributes, and then the the whole thing just explodes. Um, and in physics, this is called something. It's called spontaneous dynamical symmetry breaking, where the mm-hmm. the, the perfect symmetry gets broken and diversity arises, and. Uh, but you know, look look what it arises into. I mean, after 14 billion years, look at the the incredibly complex forms that have evolved, <laughs> and, yeah. and, and and these forms are now sitting here, kind of talking about the the very nature of reality, uh, the fundamental reality which gave rise to them, and and mm. find finding means 
to return to that reality and yet remain as forms, living, breathing, eating, talking, and yet, mm. yet, yet living in that state of oneness, which gave, which you know, preceded the manifest universe. It's fascinating. Mm, it's fascinating, yeah, and it's interesting that even in our own history as a species, there, you know, that that process has unfolded, because I think prehistoric peoples and some of the world's indigenous peoples, I think they experienced uh, a sense of unity with creation as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, so many indigenous peoples had a profound respect for nature, and they were aware of a great spirit. I, mean, I think most, it's very striking that most indigenous cultures, in fact all, all of the indigenous cultures which I'm aware of, they all had a term for a spirit force, which is very similar to Brahman in the Upanishads. Mm. They all had a, a term which could be translated as maybe spirit energy or spirit force or soul force or the life force or the universal force. But to them it was, uh, it was seemingly a common everyday reality. Everybody could sense this spirit force in everything. So the river was a manifestation of this force, you know, yeah. all plants, all vegetation, the sky, the clouds, everything was a, a manifestation of spirit force and therefore everything was sacred and everything was worthy of respect and everything was treated with respect. So I think those peoples had that or maybe still have it in some cases but when I mentioned earlier the ego explosion, when that occurred people lost that awareness, we lost that sense of the spirit force pervading all reality, we lost the awareness of the spirit force and you know and that caused I call it a redistribution of psychic energy, a redistribution of psychic energy. So all of the energy was diverted to the ego, which became strongly mm. individuated, strongly separate. And we lost the awareness of spirit force. But it's interesting that now we have that strongly individuated sense of self, but we, we are regaining, you know, collectively we seem to be regaining the awareness of spirit force. Mm -hmm. So as you say, it's a question of regaining what we had before but with this sense, together with this sense of individuality and separateness. Well, not separateness, but a sense of identity and individuality. Yeah, and I think we're going to be regaining it. I think we are regaining it in the context of a much more complex and sophisticated culture. We're not going to go back to kind of a hunter-gatherer society unless, there's, unless something really ca catastrophic happens. No. Um, but, um, and you can see that, you know, the many of the technologies and, and systems that predominate in our world are, are symptomatic of what you just said, of this sort of all the energies up in the ego. I mean, genetic engineering, thinking that it, it reflects a very mechanistic um, yeah. mindset where we think we can sort of tinker with these very subtle levels of, of nature's functioning, at which we don't even understand, and yet we can, we you know, we think we think we can mess with them and pretend potential, you know, run the risk of of uh, you know destroying the food supply, um, yeah. or, or uh, there's so many examples where um, we that so many examples that reflect an attitude that we are the masters of nature rather than uh, uh, an integral mm. part of it, and that it's there for our you know our domination and our disposal rather than you know as a mother that you know we need that our very life depends upon yeah exactly yeah. I mean 500 years ago there was a, a philosopher scientist called Roger Bacon sure and his famous his oh, famous oh I'm thinking of Francis were they related oh, sorry, Fra Francis Bacon oh okay <laughs> Roger Bacon was somebody else but uh, so yeah <laughs> Francis Bacon and uh, yeah and he um his philosophy was that human beings are meant to have power over the rest of nature. There you it's go. our destiny to control mm -hmm. nature. And even in the Bible, in Genesis, it says that human beings are born to have dominion over the fishes and all of the creatures over the surface of the earth. Yeah, well, parents have dominion over their children, but they don't eat them for dinner, you know? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, it should be a nurturing relationship rather than an exploitative one. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, you know, and while we have that attitude, the end point of that attitude is self-destruction. You can't dominate everything. If you dominate everything, then ultimately you will destroy everything, and you'll be left alone. You know, to have dominion over nothing. <laughs> well, getting back to your ego point, I mean, if you get right down to it, 
we are the intelligence which is governing the universe. We are the intelligence which animates nature. Uh, and and uh, obviously here I'm referring to a, the we in a universal cosmic sense. But if we get all sort of individuated to the point where we lose our connection with that then, and, and mistake our very tiny pinpointed egos uh, for uh, as who we are mm. and, and function from there, then, then we end up being completely out of tune with that cosmic intelligence which yeah. which actually is govern everything and this and this plays right into the theme of, of your book when you know people had realizations when they let go the grip of mm. tiny individuality and well there's a bumper sticker let go and let god you know that's essentially what mm. happened to these people yeah <laughs> exactly yeah i think there's because the human ego becomes so separate and so strongly developed it also has a sense of vulnerability because if you're separate, no matter how powerful you feel in your separateness, you're still a fragment. You're still broken off from the mm -hmm. whole. Yep, and, and you're always at the mercy of forces beyond your control. Yeah. You, you can never control reality. You can never control the world. Mm -hmm. And if you're separate, you always have a sense of being incomplete. Yep. You, you, have, you always have a sense of unfulfillment. Literally. And fear. Yeah, fear. Yeah, there's an Upanishad which says, certainly all fear is born of duality. Yeah, I th I'm, I'm sure there's also a quote in the Upanishads where there is no separateness, there is no fear. Exactly, probably the same. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I think that, that sense of vulnerability leads to a desire to make the ego even stronger. Mm -hmm. It leads to a desire to accumulate things, to accumulate power, status, possessions, achievements, and so forth, beliefs, and so forth. And so, it, so the ego becomes even stronger. It becomes sort of, um, you know, covered with attachments and accoutrements. But ironically, because it becomes so strong, it becomes even more separate. Yeah. It becomes even more alienated from sort of the ground of being beneath the ego, the, the ground of the true self. Hmm. So I think what happens when people go through these terrible experiences of turmoil, like Kevin, um, who we mentioned earlier, Kevin and... Um, Michael, who we mentioned earlier, all of these attachments are, are broken away. You know, all of the accoutrements which, you know, which collect around the ego are broken down. So the ego has nothing to support it anymore. So it just collapses, mm -hmm. like a you know, like a house of cards or like a like a building in an earthquake. And when when that occurs, when the ego collapses, then there's a, there's a space for a latent higher self to emerge. So that latent higher self suddenly unfolds and emerges and it, establ it establishes itself as you know a person's normal state yeah and i would reiterate that you know one can choose to embark on this process intentionally and it may not have to get to the point where you need to be smashed down you know where you, where you get all, all so calcified that you need a hammer to break the shell uh, you know the whole you know, idea of non-attachment and so on in spirituality doesn't necessarily mean giving up all your desires and your possessions and all that. It just means culturing the awareness of the deeper value of life, which in in and of itself is not bound by those specific you know, by by you know individual ego, individual identity. And mm -hmm. you know, if you can establish yourself there, then you can live a very rich, fulfilling life without having to go through a lot of trauma in order to, to get there. And you, you, you mentioned yourself, you'd had some profound awakenings. Perhaps would this would mm. be a good, good point mm. to kind of like talk about those. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Yeah, it's by no means, I mean, many people do experience sudden transformation after turmoil and trauma, but by no means everybody experiences awakening as a result of that. For many people, awakening is a very gradual and organic process through years of spiritual practice, mm -hmm. and years of self-development. I'm also finding more and more like people get in touch with me um, who are often quite young people who mm. have had profound spiritual awakenings. They're just glowing like a light bulb and the, and it's not really a problem for them. They're in a very blissful state, but they haven't, you sometimes haven't learned to integrate it yet. Mm. And, and, you know, in, in some cases have actually lost, pretty much lost the ability to speak and function for a while like Eckhart Tolle did or mm -hmm. Byron, Byron Katie until they have managed to integrate it. Um, but, uh, 
uh, uh, the, the, you know, speaking of kind of an epidemic of spirituality in society, there, there seems to be this kind of thing happening more and more where people are just waking mm. up without having to go through a lot of hard knocks first. Yeah, I think so. I think, I, mean, I think one of the difficulties is when you undergo awakening, it has to be integrated. You have to be able to, on some level, understand what's happened to you. Yeah. And if you know nothing of spirituality, if you have never investigated any spiritual traditions or never met any gurus or if you know absolutely nothing, then there's a chance that you'll pathologize what's happened. There's a chance that you'll go and see a psychiatrist and yep. we all know what happens when you go and see a psychiatrist. Well, I interviewed a guy about a month ago named David Gersten who wrote a book called Am I Getting Enlightened or Losing My Mind? Mm. And uh, we talked about that for the whole time. It's like you know, so many people go to psychiatrists who have had a spiritual awakening and they just get drugged. Yeah, you know, and, and in some cases institutionalized. I know. I mean, that's why, in some ways, it's it's such a, a positive development that spirituality is becoming more. Well, you know, it's it's getting more and more attention. It's becoming more and more and more of a mainstream media phenomenon, because it will provide people with a, a framework to understand what's happening to them. Yeah. So that yeah. so they'll recognise the signs. Yeah. So it's, it's, but it is really important to have that framework of understanding, so people who are supportive around you. I mean, I found in my research that when people had, you know, if they'd been practicing meditation for a while, or if they had a background in Buddhism, or even if they were just familiar with some spiritual teachings from spir some spiritual books, that they had a much better chance of, you know, having a experience of fairly quick integration, integration, but not too many difficulties, mm -hmm. not too much confusion, and so forth. But for me, for me personally, you asked about my own yeah. personal experience. And I think I probably was one of the people who were, who were naturally spiritually awakened to some degree from a young age. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I was maybe from the age of 15 or 16, I experienced what I would call now you know, awakening experiences. I had um, experiences of unity and bliss. Did you do um, any drugs or anything, or was it just spontaneous? <laughs> that was that was later on. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I experimented a little later on, uh -huh. but no, it was at that time it was spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So I was very drawn to open spaces and to nature. I loved to walk around, to walk in open spaces, and I would feel that sense of connection to reality and a sense of inner well-being, a sense of inner stillness and harmony. Well, the difficulty was that I had no idea, I had no way of understanding these states of mind. So after a while, I began, I probably began to pathologize them a little bit. I thought, you know, what's, what's wrong with me? Why am I so different to other people? And I couldn't talk about it with my family. And I had no background in religion or spirituality. Uh, so it was quite difficult. So I did become, for a few years, I became quite depressed and alienated. I didn't really understand what was happening inside me, although I still had occasionally had glimpses of higher states of consciousness. I still had very profound, peak experiences. But it was only maybe when I was 21, 22, I began to read. Well, I, I began to practice meditation. I went to a TM class and learned meditation, mm -hmm. and I began to read books about myst mysticism. I began to meet other people who were interested in spirituality. So that was when the framework I was looking for began to be established. And I began to think, wow, you know, there's, there's not something wrong with me. I'm actually, you know, this is really good. I feel really positive about this. This, this is something really positive that's happening. So, yeah, I really began to understand what was happening to me. So at that point, it became more integrated. And there were still a few difficulties. I had to sort of work on other areas of my, my being. I had to learn to function in society, which took me a long time. <laughs> I'm, st I'm still... Yeah, we're I'm still all still working, working on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's become a bit easier. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so by the time I was 30, I felt as I became really, really quite integrated and this, this natural wakefulness I'd been born with, it really became, you know, well-established and well-integrated into my being. <clears throat> and how old are you now? I am 46 now. Okay, and so uh, so you've just been cruising along ever since then, or have there been some you know occasional dramatic shifts that seem to be you know real breakthroughs and that then stabilize? Well, yeah, there've been a few a few changes, a few shifts. Um, one of them was maybe 
maybe 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I felt as though I'd really kind of made it. I felt, <laughs> I felt as though I'd sort of, uh, I was resting in a fairly permanent, ongoing state of awakening. Mm -hmm. Everything was going really well. I felt really attuned to my deeper self, really attuned to, you know, spiritual force outside me or inside me. But I felt really, it really connected and really deeply awakened. But one problem was I'd, at that point, ironically, just as I had that sense of being, you know, I felt almost as if I'd reached the end of the journey. Then a few difficulties arose. I had some health problems, and I had a problem with. I, had, I started to have tinnitus in my ear, which caused oh, yeah, ringing in the ear. Yeah, and it was. Um, I still have it now, but ten years ago, it was very. It's still the same now, but it was extremely loud. Was too extreme. much. Too much rock and roll back in the day, or it probably was because I was a musician in my twenties. Oh, yeah, me too. Were you drummer? Oh, I was a bass player and singer. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think it probably was connected to the music. Yeah. So for, for a year or two, it was very disturbing, the constant screeching, mm. very loud screeching in my ear. And it's that guy in The Who who has to, like, if, if, if they perform, I don't know if he's still alive, but he used to have to be in a plexiglass bubble or something during performances because he had such bad tinnitus from the, you know, having been exposed to so much loud noise. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it was similar. I think it's quite common amongst pop musicians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so and, and also uh, about ten years ago, I started a family. You know, I've got three young children now. Right. And that, you know, everybody who has young children knows it causes some challenges. Right. It makes life uh, a bit more complicated. There's a whole set of um, challenges and obstacles. But on the other hand, it brings in, you know, the, a large number of positive effects of that too. Yeah. I mean, did you feel that disturbed your awakening or that inner serenity or whatever you call it? Or was it even a way of grounding or stabilizing it? Well, I feel as though in some ways it disturbed it. Mm -hmm. Because on one level you have less time to be alone, you have less time to meditate and so forth. Yeah. I think in spirituality you can go the way of the monk, which means you isolate yourself from everyday life. You don't have a family you don't have a job, you concentrate all your energies on inner development, you shut yourself away from the world. That's one way to go. And I think I was, I was probably following that path before I had children. I was kind of quite a solitary person. Right. Um, I love to spend time on my own, probably quite reserved as well. Mm -hmm. But once you have children, obviously you can't follow that path anymore. <laughs> you sort of, right. you have to become much more worldly, and mm -hmm. uh, much more responsible, much less self-centered. I mean, in some ways, spiritually, you know, people who engage in spiritual development are sometimes accused of selfishness. And sometimes they are. They become. They can become very obsessive about you know their little routine and their comfort and their you know all that stuff. Their food and all. Mm. yeah, that's right. Yeah. But obviously, when you have children, you you can't do that anymore. You become yeah. You have to become less self-centered. You have to make continual self-sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So it becomes another path of development, you know. And it, it, in some ways, it does have similarities with a spiritual path because you're constantly practicing service. You're serving other people. Yep, it's definitely a spiritual path. I mean, you, you know, the word seva, you know, which means service. It's uh, considered to be a completely important valid spiritual practice mm, mm. Uh, and you know parenthood is definitely a form of it definitely yeah definitely mm. so do you, so do you me, still do you still do TM I or, some, or some, fo some form of meditation yeah I, I, I have a few different techniques I still meditate occasionally mm -hmm. maybe two or three times a week mm -hmm. but sometimes I enjoy just uh, walking in the countryside yeah uh, just and also just uh, living very quietly and simply when the children are in bed. <laughs> yeah. I think what, you know, one thing that comes to mind is when we talk about this sort of thing, we're, you know, we have to remind ourselves what we're really talking about. I mean, what is awakening after all? What is enlightenment? There's a magazine with that title. Uh, it's called Enlightened Next now. But because uh, the terms are thrown around so casually uh, in spiritual circles uh, that I don't know, I, th I don't think we all necessarily agree on the same definitions but we some we maybe assume we do you mm. know and um, 
there was a I don't know if I can do justice to the Rumi quote, but there's a, there's a tendency to think of our our you know enlightenment or awakening as just be, being a sort of a nice settled state of consciousness that I the individual am experiencing. You know, mm. it's it's this nice experience I am having. But you know, every, everyone who undergoes a really radical shift says, oh well, it's really not the I who gets awake. Um, mm. <laughs> in fact, I just saw a cartoon recently. It had a person sitting in Lotus, and it said, "It's all fun and games until somebody loses an eye." <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but you know, really, what what one awakens to is the fact that one is not really just this individuality. That that's just a, a kind of a vehicle that's contained within a much larger reality, the reality of Brahman, and that's the, mm. that that's what one is. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, and in some ways, when that happens, it can make uh, everyday life a bit more difficult because everyday life is often you know, acted upon from the standpoint of being an I, being a separate individual. Mm -hmm. So it can sometimes take a while to adjust to that sense of, you know, to losing that sense of I. Yeah. I know there's uh, some people have lost it so abruptly and so radically that it throws them into a state of fear and confusion for a long period of time sometimes, mm. you know, mm. because, they, they, because they find themselves still functioning, even, you know, pursuing academic career, raising a, a child or something, and yet they can't locate a sense of I, and, and as long as they keep trying to locate one, there's fear. There was, I'm, I'm referring actually to a book by Suzanne Siegel called Collision with the Infinite, in which she had mm -hmm. that experience. Um, yeah. And... Uh, but then her resolution was finally she she met with Jean Klein, the spiritual teacher, and and relaxed into an acceptance of what had happened mm, to her, mm. and, and realized that it was actually a, 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 a you know a, a gain, not a loss. Uh, yeah, yeah. I read a book by Bernadette Roberts, which, mm -hmm. was, which was very similar. She, similar idea, yeah. Yeah, she lost the self, and she experienced herself as nothing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was an incredibly distressing, confusing experience to, to have nobody there. Well, yeah, I think acceptance is, you know, again, acceptance is incredibly important because, you know, the difficulty comes with resisting the predicament by feeling that there's something wrong with it. Mm. But if you accept it, then it becomes much more positive. And also, you, you have to trust it. I think the problem is that when you lose the sense of I, you kind of you feel as though there will be nothing in its place, but there is something in its place. There is a kind of a, a natural, spontaneous flow of experience, but you have to trust that flow to manifest itself. Now, I mean, even in everyday life, the, the, the I actually does very little. You know, so little of our experience is actually controlled by the I, by the thinking I. Most of what we do is instinctive, spontaneous, even unconscious. Mm -hmm. And probably only about, I don't know, I reckon maybe one or two percent of our actions are actually conscious, are consciously produced by the eye. Mm. So it really, you know, we can easily function without the eye being there. <laughs> we just, and I, I think even, occasionally you need to deal with problems. You need to make decisions. You need to plan. Sure. So, I mean, that can be the difficulty that there's nobody there to make decisions or to make plans. But still, I think, you know, it's possible to you can still draw on some kind of intellectual decision-making function in your mind when you yeah. need to. In, in Sanskrit, there's a term called lesha vidya, which means faint remains of ignorance. And the understanding is that without uh, some uh, lesha vidya, without some faint remains of individual faculties, and really the I is a faculty. It's not, it's not what you are, it's, mm. a, tool, it's a tool. But yeah. w without that, uh, living wouldn't be possible. You know, you'd be, a exactly. you'd be mm. like some kind of jellyfish. There wouldn't be any ability to discern, discriminate, and decide, and all the things that we need to do if we're going to be alive. Mm. Um, so, and it's just that sometimes the shift takes place so radically that, um, that in the the sort of the largeness, the vastness of, of the realization that one falls into, it's hard to discern what happened to the mm -hmm. eye. It's mm -hmm. like, well, where did it go? I seem to have lost it. Who am I? Where am I? Because it's kind of like if a guy had been living in a little tiny hut all of his life, and then he was told, 
this, this is really not your home. Here's this great palace. That's where you belong. You yeah. know, as he begins to go toward the palace, there could be a think of, of fear of, oh, my, my hut. I'm losing my hut. I better get back to yeah. it. There, it was secure. You know, it's all I knew. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's that tendency to... Um, mm. and, and again, it depends on how, how abrupt the transition is. If it's really abrupt, it can be quite... Um, disorienting. Yeah. If it's gradual and if it's integrated at every stage mm-hmm. of, the, of the way, you, you may not even know it's happened. Yeah. But I think that's very important. I mean, some there are some teachers who say, you know, you must destroy the ego, you must destroy the sense of I. Mm-hmm. But to me, completely destroying the ego, completely destroying the sense of I means becoming schizophrenic. It means, it means sort of becoming psychotic. Yeah, because that is the main feature of psychosis. You have there's nobody there in the psyche to control perceptions, to control the faculties of concentration and perception and memory. There's nobody there to differentiate mental phenomena from real physical phenomena. And you know there are, there are many similar characteristics between spiritual awakening and psychosis, but I think the main difference is that in spiritual awakening. There is usually somebody there who's kind of aware of what's happening, who's aware that they're experiencing all of these strange perceptions, these strange disturbances. But when people experience pure psychosis, they're so immersed in, in it that they can't detach themselves and observe it. Hmm. So the, the sense, so even in, then when, when people experience spiritual awakening, there's some, there's a kind of I there which is observing what's happening. There is some kind of structure in the psyche which can observe what's happening. And because of that structure, that prevents them from falling all the way into psychosis. Hmm. And it's that same kind of structure, that kind of same kind of psychological organization which enables us to plan, to make decisions and so forth. And we need that, you know, we need that to organize our lives. We couldn't function in the world without it. No matter how awakened you are. You can't function in the world without organizing your life in some way, without differentiating mental phenomena from material phenomena, and without making decisions and plans and so forth. So we definitely need some sense of I. I mean, the problem is that normally the ego or the I is so dominant within the psyche that it it sort of controls all of our resources and it becomes the real center of our lives. Mm -hmm. But really, that sense of I should have a much more peripheral an insignificant role, and I think it does. For people who are spiritually awakened, the I is still there, but it's much less significant. It's a very peripheral role. In fact, a lot of the time it may be dormant, and it's only called upon sometimes. But it does need to be there to some degree. Yeah, I've known people who, for whom intense spiritual practice has actually precipitated a psychotic breakdown. Um, it's sort of like they weren't ready for it, or it was there. Were, there hadn't been enough uh, culturing, uh, or, or you know, strengthening of of the. I don't know who who knows what the reason is, but it's there. I, there and there are whole sciences, or whole there's whole traditions of understanding of what could go wrong. You know, with Kundalini awakening prematurely or being misdirected and all that stuff, uh, you can end up, you know really flipped out and you know I've had tastes of that myself in the midst of long spiritual practice you know meditating 8 10 hours a day for weeks on end and you can mm. get get pretty nutty after a while and and, and if you don't you know, reintegrate gradually into normal activity you can stay out of balance for months and months um, mm. so but uh, on the other hand I I don't know there if you visit mental hospitals and and so on. I mean, you may find some highly spiritually awake people there who are just uh, misunderstood and and mis uh, and and messed up. You know, not properly integrated. But I think there ultimately is a a distinction. Speaking of cats, here's our cat. She's oh, making oh, her appearance. Oh, cats. <laughs> um, I don't know where our cat is. The uh, what I'm trying to say is. Um, there's a tendency to to say that there's a fine line between insanity and enlightenment, but and maybe there's some truth in that from some level of understanding. But I kind of think, uh, on the other hand, they may be, uh, for uh, for many people at least, polar opposites. Where insanity is a is a is a complete breakdown of the integ- mind-body integration and and the 
coherent functioning of of the nervous system, whereas enlightenment is a is a, almost like a perfection of it. You know, a, mm. a, a fine, a highly a high level functioning of mm. of the mind and the nervous system. Yeah, I agree. I think what happens. I think the parallel between awakening and mental breakdown is that the the normal structures of the psyche are broken down. True, you know, true. The sense of separateness breaks down, the boundaries break down. The perception, the, the way that one apprehends the world is completely different from the norm, mm, but mm. not identical. I mean, the psychotic is not perceiving the world the way the enlightened you know, no, person, no. no. No, but I think the difference is that we mentioned earlier that when people undergo severe suffering and turmoil, the normal ego can break down, mm -hmm. and there's kind of a latent higher self which can emerge yeah. and take over, you know, take over the personality, person's individual, uh, person's being. And I think the difference between spiritual awakening and psychosis is similar. That when people undergo spiritual awakening, the normal ego may break down, but a latent higher self is there ready it's kind of well established and ready to assume control if you like right but when people uh, experience pure mental breakdown there's nothing else there you know yeah there's, so it's just a vacuum it's just so there's, there's no vacuum. center they're fragmented yeah there's no center when somebody experiences awakening there is a new center which emerges there's a new yeah. structure which emerges it's a, a radically different structure yeah a totally different way of perceiving reality a totally different way of perceiving one's own being but it's still, you know, it's still a well-established psychological structure. But yeah, but if you don't have that underlying structure to replace the normal self, then that's mm -hmm. when you experience psychosis. You know, there's nothing there. You just become a kind of an empty shell, a right. bunch of disordered perceptions and cognition, cognitions. Yeah, and uh, in, in your book you talk about people, you know, cancer victims, alcoholics, people who've had serious accidents and so on, and all of those things having been a trigger to some sort of awakening for them. Were there, I didn't read the entire book, but were there some examples of people who had undergone some form of mental illness uh, and that became a doorway to awakening? Yeah, there, there were a couple of examples of people who'd had severe depression mm -hmm. and who'd become suicidal. Mm. And But I think in those cases, it, it's difficult to distinguish the... You know the causes and the symptoms, if you like, because as 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 we've said today, in some cases, spiritual awakening can bring about you know just psychological disturbances, some similar characteristics to mental breakdown. So it's not really clear whether clear whether the symptoms, you know, people are actually experiencing signs of spiritual awakening before they actually mm. awakened. But I think what also what what can often happen is that when that kind of underlying spiritual self is ready to emerge but it, but for some reason it can't, there's something stopping it maybe because there's some confusion maybe because the person hasn't accepted it, or they don't understand it they don't have a framework, maybe they path pathologize it so when that structure is ready to emerge, when that self is ready to emerge but it can't for those reasons, it can cause an incredible frustration I think I think I definitely experienced that when I was younger, when um, there was this kind of innate spirituality inside me, but because I didn't understand it, because I was pathologizing it, I didn't accept it, I resisted it, and it caused all kinds of frustrations and disturbances inside me, mm. which kind of, you know, I was suffering from depression for a long time. I was kind of, you know, I had periods when I wanted to commit suicide because the frustration was so great. Mm. So So often those disturbances are actually signs of awakening or the signs that you're not accepting your potential awakening. So it's difficult to distinguish whether the, you know, the psychiatric disturbances are the cause or the symptoms. Huh. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Mm. Um, I, can't, I guess one way of thinking of the whole awakening process is that it, it really is a reshuffling or a restructuring of the whole, one's whole makeup. Um, and I even the brain physiology undergoes huge changes. They've done some studies on that. Uh, but really, all the, the this whole sort of inner orientation and, and methods and ways of functioning get rearranged. Mm -hmm. And um, and like you say, if <laughs> if one is resisting that rearrangement, 
um, it can kind of there can be all kinds of bottled up pressure that can be problematic. But yeah. if one, if one is actually facilitating it in some way and understanding that something good is happening and cooperating with the process and mm. you know helping it along in in, in various help, healthy ways, maybe even like yoga or massage or you know this that or the other thing, um, then it can just be an adventure and you know, a, a, a kind of a, an enjoyable process. Mm, that's right. And I think it connects to evolution as well. We mentioned, we were talking earlier about evolution and the evolution mm -hmm. of consciousness and how life is returning to a, a state of unity after experiencing mm -hmm. individuation. And I think somehow this, this new, you know, the psychological structure of the awakened self is, you know, it's kind of latent. I think it's becoming latent in more people. And in some ways, I think it may be the, the next evolutionary phase of you know, of life on this planet. I think in some ways that structure will be the next form which life will take. You know, it's a, it's a movement of consciousness because it seems so well established. This structure, it seems so well formed. You know, it's almost as if it's somehow been not designed, but it's a kind of a kind of some kind of, kind of um, pre-existing form which has its own reality, its own existence. I know what you mean. Uh, I think I heard you talk about that in your lecture with Ian McNeil so your your interview it's it's almost like the the people that are now awakening spiritually are sort of the forerunners or the harbingers of of something that we might see quite universally a, a generation mm. from now or, or however long it takes yeah yeah I mean one of the ideas um, in evolution right from Aristotle in ancient Greece was that higher forms are always latent inside lower forms so that even in the, mm. the simplest forms of life the potential for what they become is already there it's just it's just dormant it's like a, a latent potential huh. I think that's true of you know what's happening to the human race now I think the potential for the for this higher self which is slowly emerging is there it's kind of dormant inside us and it, it is latent it's kind of latent self which underlies the normal self so you know, so again, so the the higher form is latent in the lower form again. So yeah, slowly that higher form is emerging. Well, this higher self we're talking about, it's not just some little kernel within the individual structure. It's it's the universal reality. It's that ocean of consciousness that we're that we're all swimming in, and we're just kind of like instruments which are capable of reflecting it to one degree or another. So uh, you know, I think what you're saying is that. Uh, we're all higher. We're all hardwired to be able to live that consciously, and that um, that hardwiring is kind of uh, waking up or realizing its potential more and more commonly these days. Mm, I think so, and, and I think it's also very clear that we can't continue indefinitely in the present human state. You know, the no. the, the narrow egoic self is, in some ways, it's very pathological. It's a uh, a state of near insanity in itself, which mm -hmm. is you know, the subject of my book. Yeah, you wrote a whole book insanity. about that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in, it, can, it can't survive indefinitely. The end point of, you know, the, the ego itself is self-destruction and the destruction of everything, the destruction of the planet. Mm. So, in some, I mean, one way of looking at it is that this new higher self could be some kind of response to the negativity of our, our present situation, some kind of natural check, if you like. Mm -hmm. Was that the conclusion of that book? Uh, basically, that realization of the hi higher self on a on a kind of a more global scale will be the antidote to all these intractable problems we face. Yeah, I mean, the basic idea of the book is that the discord we were aware of in the world, all of the the warfare throughout human history, all of the oppression and brutality, the domination of women, the s slavery, and all these things, environmental destruction. All of this external discord is really a kind of outward reflection of the discord inside us. Right. And you know, so, so my term was humania. I said that most human beings exist in a state of near insanity, which I call humania. <laughs> and it's insanity because separateness is a kind of insanity because we're never separate. Even on a physical level, we're never really separate. We're interacting with our environment. There's a flow a chemical flow, biological flow between us and our environment. You know, there are so many levels in which we're interconnected, physically, emotionally, spiritual, but we experience this strangely 
<clears throat> well, the sense of separation, which seems strangely real and strangely, you know, permanent. <clears throat> and also the, the constant disturbance of our thought chatter means that we're in a, we live in a state of inner discord a lot of the time. And, you know, this, this associational chatter produces negative emotions. It triggers negative emotions, negative feelings. And in many ways, you know, the, the discord inside us produces a sense of incompleteness, a desire to complete ourselves with wealth and power and status, a desire to dominate other human beings, a desire to dominate nature, and so forth. So it can be easily, you know, you can see, you can see quite easily that it's the root cause of all of these problems like environmental destruction and warfare and oppression and so forth. So the, really, the only way to create a harmonious world is to create harmony inside ourselves, mm -hmm. which means transcending the sense of separation. It means quieting the discord, healing the discord of our minds and experiencing like a sense of inner wholeness and inner stillness. And really, it's only then that the desire to dominate other people, the desire to accumulate wealth and status, it's only when... It, we've developed inner harmony that these desires will fade away and all of the warfare and all of the conflict all of the exploitation which these desires produce will also fade away so yeah so really the only possibility we have of living in harmony with the world is to develop harmony within ourselves it seems so obvious when you say it and it, you know it seems obvious to me anyway um, and, and it's, it, that was one of the basic TM lecture talking points that individual peace is the basis of you, world peace and so on but um, you know it's strangely it's not obvious to the vast majority of people they're, they're looking for solutions <coughs> as, as Einstein put it on, on the level of consciousness which created the problems mm. uh, you know, looking outward for for solutions and you know and obviously there have to be certain outer accomplishments to deal with certain things you need you know advanced solar panels for instance to have proper you know solar power and that kind of thing uh, those things are valuable but um but i would say that what you just said very eloquently is is the key to it that that spiritual realization is the ultimate um uh solution to the world's problems that's right but it, i mean it doesn't mean that you stop caring about the world it doesn't mean that you stop trying to make things better in the right. world it's just a it's a fundamental component, you know. It's yeah. like uh, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else should be added unto thee. Or, mm. you know, as as the Gita says, you know, established in yoga, perform action. Uh, it's like we need the solar panels. We need to eliminate, you know, child prostitution. We need to, uh, you know, feed everybody. We need to, and that that's all going to take. Uh, mm. action on relative levels and particular skills and technologies and all that mm. stuff is fine but but without kind of a foundation of um, yeah. of spiritual awakening it seems to me that it's like a castle in the air it's, it's just not going to mm. have, have the stability or yeah. the, it's, it's, that's just not going to work yeah it, it can only really work once there's a foundation of inner harmony mm -hmm. and ironically you know it's when you establish inner harmony that you become more compassionate you feel more of a sense of purpose to, a sense of mission to alleviate other people's sufferings, to improve the predicaments of other people. So that kind of social action follows from, it follows very clearly from spiritual awakening. It does. You know, as you mentioned earlier, sometimes people think that spiritual people are selfish, and maybe they may be at a certain stage. But uh, but if you've really achieved, you know, if you yeah. really if you've really realized, then my cup runneth over. You know, you naturally yeah. you naturally yeah. begin to flow in terms of compassionate action. Mm, that's true. I mean, I found that I did, I recently, in my role as a psychologist, I did a study of 25 people who'd experienced spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my findings was that, uh, I'm just preparing a, a paper about it at the moment, but one of my findings was that they didn't become less integrated in the world. They, they didn't become less involved in the world. They beca actually became more involved in the world mm. because they had a sense of mission. They had a sense of altruism and a desire to alleviate other people's suffering yeah they become they became much less self-centered and much more altruistic mm -hmm. and that manifests itself in a desire to serve other people yeah a yeah. oh, good point worth mm. mentioning um you mentioned or maybe it was even before we started the interview that you might want to do some kind of practice or some sort of demonstration or something i'm not quite sure what you had in mind but uh, <laughs> what did you want to do, do <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do a magical trick. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Um, 
Yeah, well, actually, it may be a good, a good uh, way to end the, the, the interview. Yeah, and you also mentioned you uh, might want to read a poem or two, so oh, okay. do, do that in whichever order you want to do the things. Mm. Okay, yeah, well, well I'll lead. Uh, it's not really a meditation, it's kind of exercise. Um, okay. And this came from my book, Out of the Darkness, because when I wrote the book, and I did so many interviews with people who'd experienced awakening following turmoil and trauma, I began to think about, you know, why were they, why were they experiencing awakening? What was actually going on on a psychological or spiritual level? And I realized that it was about attachment, that all of these people's attachments were being broken down. Because when you face death, everything is taken away. There's no more possessions. There's no more future. There's no more past. No more status. No more achievements. Everything is taken away. So, you know, all of the building blocks of the ego are suddenly withdrawn and the ego collapses. So that made me aware of how important detachment is in the spiritual process. How important it is to dissolve our psychological, to become aware of our psychological attachments and to dissolve them. So this is an exercise based on the idea that we need to dissolve our psychological attachments in order to uncover that deeper spiritual self underneath. So it's a, it's a kind of meditation, so for all of the people uh, watching this, maybe you can sit in a, a fairly comfortable position and maybe close your eyes for a few moments. And first of all, I want you to just uh, picture yourself walking along a very long straight road. You can see this road stretching far into the distance and you're walking step by step along this road and you can also see it stretching behind you. If you look behind, you can see this road stretching forever as far as you can see into the past behind you. And at this point, I want you to think of a couple of maybe one or two significant events that you're aware, you're aware of in your future. Maybe an appointment or a deadline, maybe even an ambition from your future. And maybe if you can just picture a scene from the future related to that event. Maybe place that scene by the side of the road as you walk along. And also behind you maybe you can think of one or two significant events from your past or experiences. And maybe picture a scene related to that event or that experience place them by the side of the road. So you're aware of those events or scenes from the future and the past as you slowly walk ahead step by step along this long straight road. And there in the distance you're suddenly aware of a grey mist which emerges in the distance, a foaming, soft, grey mist which emerges and slowly moves towards you. It slowly covers the road as it moves towards you. It covers the scenes from those events and it moves towards you slowly you can slowly feel its soft, warm glow as it moves towards you. And the mist slowly immerses you. You can feel it over your skin. You can even feel it inside you, foaming inside you, down from your head, into your chest and stomach, into your legs. And it keeps moving behind you, 
until it slowly engulfs the events from your past and it keeps foaming further away until the whole of the road in front of you and behind you is covered with this foaming mist, this soft grey foaming mist. You can't see anything. You're just aware of this mist everywhere around you. But slowly now, just as the, the sun sometimes begins to shine through a fog in the morning. Slowly the mist begins to fade away, to dissolve away. And as it dissolves away, you're aware that the road has disappeared. There's no road in front of you. There's no road behind you. There's just a panorama a natural panorama of fields and trees, hills in the distance, the sky above you. And there's no in front of you or behind you, there's just a panorama. And as you're aware of this panorama, I'd like you to make a, a gentle mental effort to let go of attachment to the future or the past. Just remember that the future and the past don't really exist. They're just ideas. And the only thing which really exists is the panorama of the present. So just let go of the future and let go of the past. And now think of any beliefs that you may have about the world or about life. Any political beliefs, any religious beliefs, any beliefs about the afterlife or about the paranormal. And remind yourself that all of those beliefs are just concepts or ideas. They have no connection with your essential energy, your essential self. So make a gentle effort to let go of all those beliefs. Just release your attachment to those beliefs. And now think of all of the achievements you've accumulated in your life which give you a sense of status. All of the senses, a sense of status you may develop through your job, through your qualifications, through the role you have in society. And remember that all of those achievements and all of the status you feel you have is just an idea in your head or maybe in other people's heads. None of it has any connection to your essential self. So make a gentle effort to let go of those achievements and that status. Release yourself and those attachments. And the same with any knowledge you've built up in your life. All of the information you've absorbed through books or through courses. All of the knowledge that may sometimes make you feel that you're a bit special or significant. Remember that knowledge is really just based on memory, memory of information. It has no connection to your essential self even though it can be useful sometimes. It has no connection to your essential self. So again, let go of your attachment to that knowledge. Release yourself of that attachment. And the same with your possessions. Any money you might have in your bank accounts,
any objects or material goods which you claim as your own. They're just objects which can't belong to anybody. They just exist in themselves. So again, let go of attachments. Let go of your attachment to those possessions or to that wealth. Release yourself from your possessions. And think about your appearance. Think about your outer form, the clothes you wear, your hair and your body, the way other people perceive you. And again, remember that this outward form, it really has no connection to the energy of your inner being even though the energy exists within the outward form, even though it may manifest itself within that form, your actual outward appearance has little significance. So make a gentle effort to let go of attachment to your appearance. And the same with your age. Remember that your age is just a number representing the the number of orbits of this planet around the sun it has no real significance and no connection to your inner being so let go of any attachment to your age and even your name remember that your name was just a sound assigned to you by your parents for ease of communication it has no connection to your essential being and now after we've released ourselves from attachment to the future, the past our beliefs, our achievements our knowledge, our possessions our appearance, our age and our name. What's left at the end of this process is only an energy and a consciousness. The pure, essential energy of your being and the awareness which enables you to perceive the world around you energy and awareness and this energy and this awareness exist in a natural state of fullness and well-being which doesn't require any external attachments so just for a few moments let's rest within this pure essential part of your being and let's just rest within its wholeness and its natural quality of well-being. Let's just rest within that for a few moments now. And now, when you're ready, return your awareness to the sounds inside this room. Be aware of yourself sitting on this chair. And when you're ready, let's bring the meditation or the exercise to a close and open our eyes again. That was nice. <clears throat> Thanks. Hmm. 
Do you want to read a poem also? Okay, I'll read a poem. Um, I'll read one, a very simple poem, which was based on... It's basically a description of an experience I had two or three years ago. A very simple experience. The, the poem's kind of self-explanatory, so I won't, I won't explain it. It's called The Alchemy of Attention. And this is from my book, my book of poems, The Meaning. When a mist of multiplying thoughts fills your mind, associations spinning endlessly, images jostling and memories whirling, free-falling through your inner space. You can always bring yourself back to now. This morning, making breakfast for the kids, I catch myself daydreaming and with a gentle mental nudge, remind myself of where I am. And straight away, the kitchen clutter turns to spacious presence. A, mo a mosaic of sunlit squares across the floor, fading and brightening with the passing clouds. The metal rims of stools firing sparks, steam curls floating over cups, reflecting silver spoons. The perfect stillness of spilt coffee grains, the gaudy yellow and blue of detergent bottles, and the window smudges exposed by sun. Everything perfectly still and real, everything perfectly itself. Attention is an alchemy that turns dullness to beauty and anxiety to ease. And maybe I'll read just one more. This is called The Meaning. And Attention is an alchemy which turns dullness to beauty and anxiety to ease. That's nice. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and in a way, that's about acceptance too because we've talked a lot about acceptance. Mm -hmm. And when you accept your present experience... The experience becomes transformed, mm -hmm. as, it, as it did in that poem. But often we we habitually think that, especially daily chores like you know making breakfast or washing the dishes, we're conditioned to think that those chores are too dreary for us to actually pay attention to. But when we actually do it, you know the experience becomes transformed. So this is a poem called "The Meaning," and this came from. The idea, I mean, all through my life, people have been saying, you know, what's the meaning of life? People are always asking, what's the meaning of life? And they expect you to put it together into a, a sentence or a statement. But this, the idea of this poem is that the meaning is not something expressible in words. It's something beyond words. The meaning. You can't explain the meaning reduce it to thought or confine it to words break it down to basic building blocks or trace it back to an origin but when you see the meaning you know it just when you've forgotten it existed you're driving along the motorway and turn your head to the side as if someone's tapped your shoulder and it's there stretched across the evening sky filling the spaces between the clouds you open the door to empty the bin, and it's there, rustling with the wind through the trees, stroking your face softly like a lover. You tilt your head back to catch the rain, and it's there, falling with the infinite silver points that bring down benevolence from the sky. Your eyes spring open in the middle of the night, as if there's an intruder, an unfamiliar noise, and it's there, in the dense, rich darkness that fills the room and the glow of unconscious communion around you and your partner's bodies. The most familiar forgotten place, your home from a previous lifetime, a mother's soothing presence and her warm and folding arms. Nice, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>
I told you earlier I had a hard time reading poetry because I sometimes aren't settled enough, but I just you know, kind of settled in and really enjoyed those. Well, your, yeah. your, your little exercise was very settling also. Mm. I think in some ways poetry works better when it's read aloud. It's true, yeah. I mean, if you're just sitting and reading it, sometimes your mind will wander off on other things, but to, you, you can just focus in when someone else reads it. That's right, yeah. And or when, perhaps when you read it yourself, it's good to read it aloud. Mm. You know, if you're even if you're alone, you just read it aloud. It helps to. Yeah, I think in some ways it can be a kind of spiritual exercise because mm -hmm. poetry demands or requires a kind of stillness of being to to take in, you know, the meaning and the effect of the poem. It does. Good. Mm. All righty. Well, let's. Uh, we can conclude. Um, really enjoyed talking to you. I've been talking with Steve Taylor. Um, hopefully this interview will kick you up a notch or two on the list of the 100 most spiritually well, I'm, influential I'm actually, people. I'm actually going down because last Oh, you're year, slipping? Yeah, last year I was number 31. This year I'm 38, so I'm actually oh, dear. on the downward curve. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'll start a list of the world's least uh, influential spiritual people and you'll make that eventually. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm aiming for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so in any case, I've been talking to Steve and uh, I'll, as always I'll be linking to his website and his books and whatever else is significant from batgap.com. Uh, so if you just happen to you know, have heard this interview uh, you know, somewhere or other, but if you go to batgap.com, you'll, you'll find all sorts of information, not only about Steve and his you know, background interview, but also all the other 180 or so interviews I've done so far and, and others I'll continue to do. Um, there also you can sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted. There's a tab there you'll see. Um, there's a discussion group which crops up around each interview and I think what we're going to try starting with Steve's interview is rather than have the discussion take place right on his page uh, we're going to set up a we have a forum and we're going to set up a section in the forum for each interviewee and have the discussion take place there and that will tend to make the discussions hopefully more relevant to the, each particular interview rather than 600 posts uh, being put on the which whatever happens to be on the top of the page that given week, which is the way it's been happening, and they tend to go way off the topic of the interview. So we're going to try that. Um, and so what else? Um, there's a donate button there, which I appreciate people clicking if uh, um, they have the capacity and the motivation. And I usually just pass right over that because I don't like to dwell on it. But my intention is hopefully to continue to keep these interviews free and accessible to all. There, there are some sort of spiritual shows uh, that you can get into on the internet where you have to pay a monthly fee and all, and people have suggested that. But if the thing can grow enough that this level of donations just that come in spontaneously are adequate, we'll be able to just keep it free. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and finally, I think, oh, yes, there's an audio podcast, which if you like to listen to things while you commute and so on, you can subscribe to that and get it on iTunes. So that about does it. So thanks, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Rick. So I really enjoyed speaking to you. It was great. Yeah. And uh, thanks to those who've been listening or watching, and we'll see you next week.